Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com, and we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by Rollbar. Move fast and fix things. Resolve errors and minutes and deploy with confidence. Head to Rollbar.com slash Changelog. Request a demo. Get started today. It's loved by developers, trusted by enterprises, and most of all, we use it here at Changelog. Move fast and fix things with Rollbar. Once again, Rollbar.com slash Changelog. Welcome to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the shows at the changelaw.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at JS Party FM. And now on to the show. G'day, you're listening to another episode of JS Party. This is episode number 28. This is a weekly celebration of everything JavaScript. I'm Sue Sinton. I'm your host for this episode, and I'm joined, as usual, by some fantastic panelists, as always. So first, we have Cable on the panel. Hey, Cable, how's it going? Hey, doing good. Ready to roll. Awesome. Second of all, we have Chris. Welcome back, Chris. Good day. And last but not least, we also have Jared. Jared, it's great to have you. It's great to be here. I'm not a machine, but I'm here to learn. (laughs) I was expecting something like this from you. (laughs) (laughs) So Jared has given a little bit of a spoiler of what we're going to be talking about uh, this week. We're going to be covering machine learning. And that sounds a little bit weird, given that we're talking about JavaScript on JS Party, but... uh, Lately, there's been some really, really cool activities happening around the combination of data science, machine learning, and JavaScript. And so we're going to start out by just summarizing a conference that uh, I actually was lucky enough to attend this week. It's called ML for All, which stands for Machine Learning for All. And if you go to uh, ML4, which is the numeral for uh, all, A-L-L, dot org, Uh, You can actually go check out the videos, um, the schedule, and also just what the whole conference was about. But normally when you think of machine learning conferences, you think of something like a very academic, very dry, um, and very kind of full of math and scary terms that you don't know. You know, um, you you imagine a a room where everyone sits and, and experiences that kind of thing. But this conference, which was organized by a really great community of people, Um, including some of my colleagues, was designed to make it more accessible for people to be able to access machine learning in a context where they're just learning from the very beginning. So I thought that was really, really cool. I learned a ton. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, give a presentation at the conference too, even though I'm not an expert in machine learning. So I think that says a lot about the conference's uh, approachability. So that's a quick summary. Um, But the reason why I wanted to talk about this a little bit, Jared, did you have something to say? Well, I was just going to comment on the the videos. They're all online now. And uh, Sue's linked us up here in order to prepare. I was was actually watching Kaleo Hao. Can't say his last name. It's Hao. Kaleo Hao's Jump or Not to Jump, Solving Flappy Bird with Deep Reinforcement Learning, which I had never heard of uh, reinforcement learning. And I'm like 80% of the way through that. He's kind of blowing my mind. So uh, interested at, at a certain point today to get your thoughts on on that topic as well. Yeah, absolutely. Kaleo's talk was one of my favorite there. We ended up doing a little behind the scenes interview too. And that's been hopefully uploaded to the same YouTube channel cool. as well, which is really, really fun. Yeah, Kaleo took um, like a reinforcement learning mathematical formula, you know, acknowledged how scary it looked and then he broke it down. So it made it really easy to understand. I'm really glad that you ended up looking at that video. Yeah, I started off intimidated, and he was—he said I was asked to d- to explain the math behind this, and I thought, hmm. but he he did such a great job of of setting it up that I was like, well, I'll give him five minutes, and then like five minutes in, I was hooked and I, I was into it. And <laughs> so far, it actually does make sense as he describes the math, which uh, that's that's a, a feat with me is to get me to understand uh, deep math things is 
is quite a task. <laughs> I'm not that far behind either. I'm, I took advanced math in high school, but then sort of started bombing out my last few years of high school. So it's definitely something that I've always wanted to be better at. Um, the cool thing is that Kaleo also put his Flappy Bird example up on GitHub. So I'm yet to track that down, but he said it's definitely there. Nice. Cool. Uh, we, there were some other talks, though, that were really surprising to me because they actually called out JavaScript and machine learning. So I think the, the biggest one was Amy Chang's. She opened on the second day and she talked about using machine learning to create art. And it became a very existential talk towards the end of it where she said, is this even art? Is, is using techniques um, that people have probably seen, such as style transfer, where, you know, you can take a photo and then paint it in the style of Van Gogh, you know, that sort of example. She was asking questions such as, is this art or is this a machine just copying things? And she talked about this concept um, of this uh, professor that she was reading an essay from about the the concept of like the machine learning's aura rather than it just copying like, you know, the aura of human art. And I thought that was really fascinating. What is the machine learning's aura? What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, the apparently the essay doesn't really say what it is, but I think what they're saying is right now we're using machine learning to just emulate human art or existing computer art. But what if what if machine learning was supposed to create like different art that was sort of more more idiomatic to the actual neural network rather than again just directly copying human stuff? So apparently we're yet to see that, and I think the aura is insinuating that hopefully that will emerge at some point. One of the things I really like about this idea of using machine learning for art is it kind of plays into to one of the things that I think is the strength of machine learning in JavaScript, which is accessibility. It's bringing this stuff to perhaps a an audience that is a little bit less grounded in all of that crazy math and deep stuff and saying, hey, you know what? You can play with this right now, right away and do cool stuff with it. You don't have to understand all of the deep underlying pieces. That's a really uh-huh. excellent point. And Amy was talking about that in her talk because she used she used mostly JavaScript tools to do it. She used like Synaptic JS and ML5 JS. And ML5 JS, I think, is supposed to be sort of in the P5 JS family, which are like really friendly wrappers around Canvas. And so I think this is a friendly wrapper around TensorFlow JS, if I'm not mistaken. And I really agree with that whole accessibleness. And I think she was saying something about it's easier to share stuff if you can just send someone a browser URL. Just I'm stuck back on the uh, neural network uh, art idea and kind of these existential questions. Curious what everybody thinks, because if a neural network creates some art, then uh, who is the artist? Who owns the copyright? All these questions kind of open up and I think we have a whole new uh, a set of new questions that we start asking ourselves. Well, there's the intellectual property side. That's I, I didn't even go there at all. I was kind of coming back to this question of like, what is art, right? Is it, does, do we, you know, there's all this weird stuff about things that you or I might think are ugly or, or stupid, but it is considered art because of the mental state of the artist when they were doing it and what it got through. Uh, is art defined by the process of creation or the process of observation and consumption? I think, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's, I don't think I asked before <laughs> answer to that question. It might be beyond my uh, pay grade, but I think with regards to like the creation side of it, if you have a human who's feed, I mean, spe- specifically with machine learning based art uh, and let's use style transfer as an example, right? You have an existing image, which is selected by a human and then you have, uh, a set of training data, which is selected by a human, right? Like that's the whole thing with machine learning is we teach them based on examples and we hand them all these images. And so that's like the machine isn't choosing those things, at least not yet. And then the final product is really a result of the input. So it's still like inputs and outputs. So in the, in, in the unique case of style transfer, so I guess for those who don't know what style transfer is, you have a source image, you have a, a, another image, that has some a specific style to it, and you're basically passing one through the other in order to create something brand new. Um, and it's more complex than that. But in that case, I think like the, the human's still doing all the stuff and the machine is just kind of chunking stuff out. But I think you're probably talking more down the line where we start to hand off more decision-making to the machines. Is that, is that where you're going with that? I think that if, if we look at the example of Deep Dream, 
where you had all those weird puppies and eyes everywhere. That was the result of them sort of feeding, you know, the machine back into itself. And so then it was just generating really, really weird stuff based on a <laughs> reference image, which is not something that was really copying a specific artist or a human. Mm -hmm. But we, I, I honestly believe we interpreted that as art. And I'm interested to hear what the other panelists think as well. It certainly, you know, I'm, I'm looking right now, there's a deep gene generator.com, like looking at this, I consume it as art, right? It looks to me and I'm like, wow, that's, that's amazing. Some of that is incredibly beautiful and some of it is just bizarre, but that, that distribution of reactions is the same for me looking at a lot of human art, right? Some of this is incredibly beautiful and some of this is just why, uh, right. So one thing that I, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. So if, if, if I'm looking at deep, like something generated by deep dream and I didn't know what made it. You know, if I if I thought, well, maybe somebody somebody drew this, or painted it, or whatever, um, I would say, wow, that's really trippy, like surrealist art, sure. But because I know what created that, um, it it just doesn't feel like art to me anymore. Oh man, the hummingbird on fire—that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I so I, I mean, I don't I don't look at a deep dream and uh, you know those pictures and think of them as them as art. And I, I mean, I, I assume I'm not alone in that um i think you know if if you know we're looking at ml as a source for art uh there's gonna be a, quite a few people who are gonna have you know some issues with that i think yeah i mean i th I, and I don't have the philosophies around art but i believe that it's you know it's created in order to invoke some sort of emotion or reaction right and so there's regardless of whether it actually connects with the consumer like in cable all your situation like some stuff you think is just crazy and isn't good and i have the problem with some art where i'm like this doesn't require skill like it's like especially splatter paintings i look at them I'm like you know my my three-year-old could do that is that art well to somebody it is right but um it's there is a there is an artist on one side of it and that's why I kind of went to the question of like, what, who's the artist? And maybe where that's where you're going with it, Chris saying it's not really art because it's, it's generated based on some sort of algorithm or some sort of, uh, inputs and outputs, but it's not like the person on one end said, I'm trying to make you sad or happy. And so therefore here's this hummingbird on fire. I mean, yeah, it's, it's not so much about that for me. It's, it's about intent. And if I intend to make art, well, you know, it's, it's. I get to call it art, but uh, a machine has no intent. You know, one of the, the really cool to me reasons why one might want to look at machine learning in JavaScript is kind of hearkening back to the shareability of it. You just put it online and it goes, what if we thought about this as a tool for creating collaborative art? You know, you throw your photos in and I throw my photos in and we, we kind of have the machine merge them together in an interesting way and we could create art suddenly not limited to who you can get in a room, but you know, you could have millions of people co-creating. Sure. I mean, or even just, you know, you have, you create a, a framework or some constraints, um, throw it up there on the web and allow people to use your website using ML to, to make their own art. And then it's, it is their art, even though it's ML as the tool behind it. Right? Is ML that different than a paintbrush? <laughs> That's deep, Kevin. Very deep. So there were a couple other talks that, Y'all, uh, that Susie mentioned, um, beyond the ML to create art, which we could go on about art for a long time, but I don't know how, how much that's going to get us into JavaScript, <laughs> but, uh, there was one on killing math, uh, which I think also ties back to this idea of making ML more accessible, something that, you know, you don't need a PhD in computer science to learn, but you can hack around with on your browser at home. You can maybe have a, you know, my kid is there learning to code. My kid's too young to learn to code yet, unfortunately. But at some point, you know, they could just be playing with this thing in a web browser without having to do anything. Uh, and then you had a talk as well that you gave. I'm not going to make you plug yourself, but um, I thought it was another really interesting example uh, where you were essentially taking an extension, a browser extension or a bookmarklet and using it to auto annotate images for accessibility, right? Looking at an image and giving a summary of what is this thing. And it made me start wondering, like, does this, when you start thinking ML in browser extensions and ML, uh, you know, in pluggable snippets that we can sort of share around, does this give us whole new ways of, of kind of parsing and viewing the web? Yeah, I saw it more from a perspective of us repairing the web. And then hopefully we can use these techniques going forward to kind of 
you know, once we've tended to the garden of the web and made it nice again, we can just keep it kind of trimmed, I guess. That's like my little analogy there. But I, I, I really like how you can use machines to identify subject material in images. And so I, I definitely have seen some not so great uses of that technology. And so I was trying to find something that would be a positive use, which is um, being able to provide alt text for images on the net that don't have alt tags already applied to them. And because it's such a huge task to do, uh, it would be it would be great if people could either do it on demand or we could run jobs on websites and, and refresh those specific pages. So that was me exploring some very idealistic views about how we can use um, things like just even REST API calls, because even if we don't want to run these models in a browser, we can make a REST API API call to a server that is able to run those um, those models in order to identify the the images. And so I was trying to show that you don't even have to create your own models. You can use existing ones that are out there. And, you know, JavaScript is very, very good at making REST calls. That's interesting. You did it as a browser extension. My immediate thought, I guess, as a website creator is there's lots of pragmatic reasons that you would want this in your server side markup as well. So I was thinking in terms of like tooling for developers, maybe it's a Webpack plugin that you can just pull into your pipeline and it can go through and, you know, check all your image elements that don't have rel, te- rel attributes or titles and then do the analysis and, and actually write that back into your either your server side code or in your, your generated Webpack HTML so that it wouldn't have to be subjective in terms of like the individual with the browser extension, but it would actually like fix it at the source. That would be cool. I know that at the source, sometimes it's easier for a human to write them, especially if you don't have a large collection of images, but it would be great if stock photography websites, for example, were able to, uh, if you download an image from that and you're using a ton of them, maybe that's the use case for being able to like automatically tag them using a machine's intelligence. Right. Or user generated content where they're uploading images, but not necessarily, you know, they're not tending to your garden quite as well as you'd hope they would, your users, you know? Yeah, that's exactly why I use Instagram as an example of that, because, you know, people tend to use pretty sort of ephemeral or uh, vague sort of captions, even if they do put their own caption on there. So they're not always appropriate to use for alt text. Yes, you're right there. So, Suze, to to make sure I understand how something like this would work, you you would have a a, a browser extension, um, and you know you're visiting a web page and there's no alt tags. Uh, maybe you, you you click the button or invoke the extension, or maybe it runs automatically. And, and what it's going to do, it's going to scrape all those um, images and send them off. That basically, it's going to take the images and and, and post them or something to to some endpoint and that endpoint's going to come back with some alt text and that will be then applied to the dom somehow is that basically what what happens yes that's exactly how it works and so it will actually go and manipulate that image tag and add in the alt text attribute i will say that there is a few privacy limitations around um, being able to use this, which is why I haven't released it as an extension or anything like that, because a lot of a lot of these models are privately owned by large companies, and you don't necessarily have the permission to take people's photos and put them through um, that system. And with GDPR, we're all extra um, conscious of, of data privacy as well. And so whenever I do this demo, I usually just use it on my friend's Instagram profile page, and I've, I already got his permission to do that. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of kind of um, discussions to have around the appropriateness of this technology. But yes, that if we had everyone's permission to do that, that's exactly how it would work, which would be amazing. That's that's interesting. I mean, my next question was going to be about privacy because, I mean, necessarily for this to work the way it's designed, you know, it, 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 moreover, I mean, you're basically, as you browse the web, it's going to take a, a, a ton of images and, and send them off to some some company, whoever owns that you know, restful endpoint. So then uh, going, going a bit further, um, what would it take to, uh, you know, run, run your own, I mean, basically have your own setup or, or run, run, run that, uh, in the browser where you have this, this kind of neural network all set up and, and you can, um, analyze images like, maybe just like in the browser itself. I mean, what what kind of re- memory requirements? I mean, like what's stopping that from happening? Why do we have to hit uh, uh, 
a restful endpoint. I don't think we really do anymore. I think that's a really good point. And so one benefit we get from hitting that endpoint is that it's continually improved. And so, you know, it's going to get better and better. Um, and the the downside of running your own model in your browser, which is completely plausible. And we're going to, I think we're going to talk about a couple of those examples in the next, the next segment of this show. Um, you could own that model and just run it locally. And I think that that would be perfectly fine to do. And I think that would get around those issues and you would really only be running the model on the images that you care about. So it's not as if you'd be running it through, through 10,000 images in a second. So I think that browsers would be more than capable of doing that. And we, we have some really cool tools now. And even before that, technically you could port open CV, uh, to WebAssembly and, and run it that way. And so, um, I think that, that is a really good idea, and I'm hoping that everyone's going to be able to kind of own their own models going forward and, and be able to understand how to constantly improve them. Uh, remind us what OpenCV is real quick. Oh, yeah. So it's an open source computer vision library, and so it doesn't actually run in the browser. I forget what it was written in. It was It's either C or it's Python, um, and I think there just might be lots of different language wrappers for it. Um, but, yeah, it's it's basically a computer vision um executable where you can you can run images through it to identify things like fa- uh, facial detection and also just like positioning of objects and things. Could we invert the problem where you have a an available model that gets trained on on images that don't have licensing problems in some form or another, but then each browser essentially pulls the updated model periodically and you're always, so you're never sending back pri- people's private images. You're always just doing that in the browser, but you can still get updates from your public image data by pulling updated models that's such a cool idea you have to open a ticket on chromium and webkit and edge or just build an extension right if you build an extension that's going to and and you need that that database so i'm not an expert in this area but i know there's lots of images that are out there for you know that are you know creative commons licensed or things where you might be able to just kind of publicly use them without too much difficulty use that to train a model that you and then export it as a set of configs that can be read by TensorFlow.js or something like that, and then have your extension pull it up. Hey everyone, I'm Tim Smith, senior producer at Changelog. We're so excited to have added the React podcast to our stellar lineup of shows. Every week, Michael Jackson has conversations with developers doing great things in the world of React. You'll hear from people like Andrew Clark, a developer on the React core team at Facebook. I'm here on the podcast to talk about uh, the thing that I spend most of my time thinking and dreaming and fantasizing and worrying about, which is React, um, (laughs) because that is what I do all day, every day. Um, even when I don't want to. James Long, who was frustrated with budgeting apps, so he decided to build his own called Actual with React and Electron. The UI design is just super overcomplicated in so many of the apps out there. Um, I mean, you look at some of the screenshots of these apps and there's like 50 numbers on the screen. The simplest question that you want to answer is, is what I just said, right? What is my finances right now? Should I buy this thing that's $200? Like, can I buy this PS4? Like, how much is that going to hurt me? Or Henry Zhu. Henry quit his job and is working on open source full time. I think uh, overall, I, I feel pretty good about it for sure. Um, yeah, there's definitely lots of unknowns and things I have to work out, whether it's just like personally or logistically, all that stuff. But I'm definitely excited for what's in store. Go to changelog.com slash react podcast or wherever you listen to our shows. New episodes come out every Tuesday. So, I mean, the the concern is that you're copying an image, basically. Yeah, and you're passing it through a model, and that model is basically, like, t- theoretically, you're going to use their content to improve the model. I don't, I don't know how deep I want to get into this, but there has been controversial, controversial use of certain images for things like facial recognition and um, gender detection, where they've used images of actual people without their consent, if that makes sense. And so... Uh-huh. If I'm passing images of Insta- Instagram through, there's going to be a lot of selfies in there. And so that's sort of where that IP becomes a real concern. So hopefully that sort of gave you a bit of an idea. Yeah, someone's personal photos are in theory private or protected data unless they put some sort of license on it saying you can use it. 
I mean, your model maybe isn't training, but if we're sending it off to a REST server, they don't know that, you don't know that that data is flowing through the web somewhere. I guess I was confused. I thought maybe you were talking about copy, copyright intellectual property stuff, but this is a bit more like a just ethical questions. Well, doesn't Instagram, I mean, there is an IP situation there as well, because don't you, you, you render some rights to Instagram when you publish on their platform. And so that there's certain, there's certain claims that they, the company Instagram actually owns on that imagery as well. It's also a requirement of a lot of these API services. You, you have to either have permission to use the data or you need to own the data yourself. So you're against the T, TNS if, uh, if you're not doing that as well. Right. There's, there's, <laughs> it's a gray area. <laughs> I mean, there's like been, you know, the, uh, mm, there's like a recently a, a, a lawsuit where, um, I, I think it was LinkedIn said, Hey company, stop using our website. Um, because this company was basically scraping LinkedIn for stuff. And I, I can't remember what happened, but I, I think it was that the, the LinkedIn actually lost that suit. And that, that, you know, makes me think, well, you know, if, if that sets a precedent, then, you know, it, it kind of opens up stuff to, um, you know, I can, because you are presenting the, these images and because you're presenting this stuff on the web, it, it becomes public essentially. And, you know, it's going to end up in my browser cache. It's going to get copied around. Um, and maybe that's going to end up in some machine learning uh, neural network somewhere. But with, with GDPR stuff going, there's a lot more impetus on companies though. You know, if you're using somebody's personal data, you have to give them a way to remove it. And once it's deep down in the model, I don't know that you can. <laughs> so that, that would put a lot of liability on a company that was using that without permission. I prefer the wild west model where we all just do whatever we want, you know, and just like, let's not worry about any of that other stuff. We'll just, we'll let it shake out. We'll let the judges shake it out. No, just me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's kind of funny, not funny, because you know, a lot of a lot of engineers say we're just engineers, and we're just doing what we're told. Ethical problems are a big thing, right? Like, if you're not going to stand up and say this is unethical, who's going to? Well, I think part of the problem is there's going to be somebody who who won't say that, and so we could do it. Or somebody else could beat us to it. I mean, you say, okay, I've got this 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 cool new AI that um, can fake a video of like the president saying something he didn't say, um, and uh, yeah, let's let's release that to the world. I mean, that's there, well, that exists, right? Sure, um, it, it exists, and and it, it's like, well, but you know, that's that's problematic. That's a problematic technology. I mean, and you know, the, the people who, who invented that, I can't remember if it was Adobe or whatever, but if they didn't do it, somebody else was gonna, you know, even if there were, there were engineers there that, that raised those ethical concerns, you know, because they could, well, certainly some other company could too. And somebody was going to do it and somebody was going to file the patent and Yada, yada, yada. So I'm not sure that slippery slope argument is is a valid way to say, hey, we as individuals shouldn't stand up for ethical decisions. Oh, I'm not I'm not arguing that. I mean, I'm just saying this is how people think. Well, I think we need to change that. I mean, and who's going to change that except role models, right? Like if if you have your set of lead engineers who are you know experienced in, in the industry standing up and saying, hey, we have to take a stand. It's not valid to say, oh, but business said so we are going to still hold you accountable to that. Like that's how a culture changes. It doesn't change if nobody takes a stand. Yeah. I mean, but you know, the buck doesn't stop the engineers either. It's, it's even, even if the engineers say no, and then the, the business itself says, okay, you guys are right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. We're not going to, we're not going to go there. Well, the next co the company, their competitor will, you know? And so it, it's more of a, I don't know. It goes beyond engineers. I think. Well, it's it a holistic beyond. problem, right? It's a social construct that we all participate in in our different roles. Yeah, society, a societal problem, um, economic problem. It makes just, me think of. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that I don't think the fact that there is a structural problem does not put individuals off the hook. The way that we change societies is we get enough people saying, "Hey, this is not right." Law and that sort of thing is downstream from culture. So. To, if you want to change the law and what's 
regulated and what's allowed and what's restricted, the the way you target that is changing the culture. Unfortunately, it's not always downstream. <laughs> Well, not well, always, but well, lots it of times it's side, it's side stream to culture, right? It's despite culture lots of times because of corruption and whatnot. True, but, I, but I mean, if you look at, for example, like the the change on gay marriage, right? That came because of in you know we were going nowhere, 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 and then there was a massive you know the culture shifted to the point where you had a, a majority of people saying what is going on here, and very quickly the politicians followed. Uh, and I think we can, if you get enough momentum behind it, say if you have two thirds of the industry talking about the ethics of this rather than saying, well, you know, I'm just an engineer. So what do I know? Or what am I going to do? Right. Things are going to shift. And that starts with a few people saying, you know what, we got to do this. And I, you know, there's, there are people out there talking about the, the ethics of this. It has become an active conversation in our industry, which I really appreciate. Um, at QCon last year, QCon SF, um, Leslie Miley, I think, um, did a keynote. And he talked, he took it head on and he was saying, you know, we're, we're creating these models that are essentially uh, digital ma- weapons of mass destruction uh, in Facebook and things where we can massively do things. We have a responsibility to be thinking about it. So it, it is a rising tide of discussion in the industry, but, you know, we need to keep pushing it. I think one thing that we could all uh, have a read of too and reference from going forward is a medium post by Laura James. It's called Oaths, Pledges and Manifestos, a Master List of Ethical Tech Values. And it has a a bunch of links, um, including ones to AI um, manifestos and pledges. Um, So I definitely, uh, definitely encourage you to read through that because there's definitely a movement happening online where... um, a lot of people are definitely signing up to start questioning themselves and their role in this. Cool. All right. So we talked a little bit in the first segment about um, just that there are some JavaScript tools for creating like machine learning models and also running them. Uh, we did mention a couple of them, such as Synaptic JS, ML5 JS, um, and TensorFlow JS. But I guess other than the shareability of it, which um, which Amy was talking about as a strength of doing something like this with JavaScript or in the browser, what are some other value propositions that you can think of for using machine learning using JavaScript, which I'm guessing will be a little bit slower than perhaps using other languages to do so? Could be slower, though JavaScript is bloody fast. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think there's a few different things that come immediately to mind. One is kind of in this idea of shareability, but just in terms of making it super easy to learn uh, and play around with concepts, uh, it's sometimes easy to forget if you're living in the web world, how, how much of a pain it can be to, to set up a development environment and do all sorts of things in tutorials that are, that have much more heavy backend requirements. Uh, Whereas I saw a post recently um, that was making the rounds called hello TensorFlow that literally just had an in-browser demo where you could play with it and you could tweak parameters and really start to understand how machine learning is working without having to install a thing. So you could do that. I mean, you could do that in the developing world on a tiny little laptop or Chromebook or even a, a phone potentially and start learning these concepts without having to get a big environment set up. I really love the idea of that so much. Um, just literally just start tweaking stuff immediately with an example that's running in the browser. That's awesome. Yeah, I think we should distinguish, I mean, in the browser versus not when we talk about anything with JS, of course, but specifically with machine learning in JS. And and like Kevin said, I mean, J- JavaScript itself is not slow. I, but I think what we talk about, you know, is, is specifically like training models in the browser on a phone or on an underpowered PC is going to be slow, right? And the difference with JavaScript with most, most other languages is it exists in the browser. Of course, we'll, we'll get there with uh, with Wasm and, or Wasm, I can't remember, Wasm and whatnot. <laughs> Don't get me off on that train, but, you know, j- server-side dra- JavaScript, right, and Node is, is completely capable of doing these things as well, isn't it? I know a lot of people are doing Python for the actual training, but that doesn't mean you can't train machine learning models in JavaScript, does it? No, you can totally train them. I think, though, that trying to import like a 35 gigabyte CSV file is going to be maybe a little bit tough for the UI thread, at least. <laughs> right. Uh, I was kind of under the impression that, I don't know, like where where did GPUs come in? I mean, do they? Uh, and if you want a GPU binding, you might not want to use JavaScript. Yeah, no TensorFlow runs in the GPU. 
Does TensorFlow JS give us access to the GPU? And can we get access to the GPU from browser running JavaScript? That would be amazing. Yeah, so TensorFlow was designed to make as much use of the GPU as possible for this kind of stuff. I guess just trying to load that initial um, large amount of memory to do the the training, just from the training data itself, um, you wouldn't quite even be at the GPU stage at that point. That That was my biggest concern. Well, even going back to Amy Cheng's talk at ML for All, she was going through the the work she was doing with Synaptic JS and MI Five JS, and she said specifically, "We can't use JavaScript to train models. There's simply too much data." Which is kind of what you're saying there. Uh, she, was, she was speaking about in the browser specifically, and she had fallback. She had trained the things with Python, and then she had, was using TensorFlow JS to actually use the models. So that's a common trend right now. Yeah, that's right. I know that TensorFlow.js um, supports uh, both uh, models that were trained by TensorFlow itself and also models that were trained with Keras, which is like a wrapper around TensorFlow, which is pretty cool. So this hello TensorFlow thing, though, I mean, there's training happening in that demo? Yeah, it's a pretty simple model, right? They're trying In that example, they're essentially modeling a quadratic curve. So it's not, uh, or not quadratic, it's... Uh, x to the third so whatever that is but um you know they're they're modeling a very simple mathematical formula rather than something really complex like recognizing something but it gives you sort of an understanding of what is the big picture of what's going on here what is it that we're we're doing when we're training something to recognize images or do things like that um and yeah with that simple of a model it's just running it the training in the browser. So where does it become too much? Like what's the threshold? I guess that's what I don't understand because if we're training in this demo on glitch or what have you, you know, why, why are we saying we can't use JavaScript to do it? Like what problems is it? Is it almost all problems <laughs> that are real world are, are just going to, to eat up too much memory to, to do or, or what? Like, where is that? Where's the cutoff? When when does when is JavaScript or, or training in the browser no longer uh, feasible? I mean, I think in some sense, I wonder if you end up being more network limited than anything else because you could probably, you know, essentially stream data through so that you're not going to be memory limited necessarily. Um, though I'm not an expert because maybe you need to load it all at once, but I, I wouldn't expect you would. But that's a lot of data. To be, you know, probably depends, right? If you're on a desktop that's wired via fast Ethernet connection, I don't know that it makes a big difference. But with the browser, you might well be on a phone somewhere, or you might well be on a, uh, you know, Wi-Fi network. Um, I don't know that I'd want to stream 30 gigabytes of training faces over my iPhone. Yeah, I think it's insightful that Monica uses numbers here, and she even states in her in her demo that numbers are, are much easier to handle than images. And so most of the things that we're going to be using these models against are images, audio streams, video streams. These are these are large data consumptive things. But I don't have a hard answer of, you know, at, at exactly this type of thing, Chris, you know, JS becomes um, unuseful. There's, you know, I I'm, think, tremendous... Yeah. Uh, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, there's, there's more to... There are more problems than just, I mean, they're, they're text-based document processing, uh, text files, reading text files, reading source files uh, with, with ML um, that seem like they would be less less intensive than, than something like image or, or video processing. You know, one thing I was thinking about in our last segment uh, that that reminds me of is kind of tied into this accessibility context. We talked about using ML to auto-annotate images, but what about to auto-annotate essentially, you know, ARIA markup and things like that for sites that are not well designed for screen readers, right? If I have a, a site that's doing all sorts of crazy things in CSS and reordering and whatever, such that the underlying markup is nonsensical, uh, could I use ML to take a, you know, to look at both the document content, but also at how it visually ends up laying out and do something smart to make it more readable via a screen reader? That would be cool. I mean, you know, even just looking at a page and saying, "Okay, here's the here's the nav bar up top. These this is what a web page looks like, right? There's a sidebar over there, and here's the content in the main stage. It's got a lot of text. Okay, you would take all that crap and basically just distill it and, and turn it into new markup and and 
and add the the aria uh, attributes and and that sort of thing, right? That'd be cool. It seems difficult, but uh, I mean, it's certainly something you could you could learn uh, a a a uh, uh, you know a model could learn from from just looking at thousands of web pages. Oh yeah, so this is where the content is. I think that has interesting potential. I think that the biggest hang up that people have about trying to make the sites accessible is that when they hear that they can't one hundred percent fully automate the fixes or automate, you know, um, the testing and CI, that's when they feel really discouraged. And I think that part of that manual testing is literally stepping through things with a screen reader or literally tapping through things with like the tab key or even just, um, color contrast is, is testable, but, um, in some cases you can't always predict when colors of text and background colors are going to be overlaid on top of each other. So what I would like to see is those really, really slow manual testing things and the things that um, require a human to really reason about, well, this this doesn't have a hard and fast rule, but in this scenario, does it actually work for somebody? I think they're the kind of avenues I'd like to see ML exploring. I think we're definitely a way off. It sounds super difficult, but I do like that this discussion is happening for sure. There's also tremendous value, you know, coming back to our question of models and training in just the the model interpretation in the browser. Um, I think one of the the coolest things I've seen recently with TensorFlow JS um, was this these folks who did uh, real time human pose estimation. So they're essentially you know, looking at a video and recognizing how people's limbs are. Uh, sort of like a Microsoft Connect type thing would do where it's like, okay, I move my limbs in this way and it recognizes where my hands are and all these different things. Uh, And that really got me thinking, you know, right now, if you want to do some sort of interactive game uh, where you're moving stuff around, uh, you kind of have to have hardware for that. You've got something that's going to be scanning you. Uh, Maybe you've got a wand or something like that. Um, We've been getting better and better at that. But what if you just went to a website and you were able to play these you know, interactive games. Maybe we could you know, stream content between you and a friend, uh, bring for us in and, and set it up with WebRCC or something like that. Um, and suddenly you've got you know, interactive physical games just using a webcam, uh, which to me, I was I, I, that, like, that sounds exciting. That sounds like the type of thing where suddenly the web is, uh, making a whole class of things that used to require dedicated hardware accessible. I really love this. And this is this is time very well around Xbox releasing their accessible controller recently, where you can plug a myriad of different devices into their inputs. And then that kind of replaces more traditional controls on a controller. I really like that. What you just said there as a suggestion really reminds me of that progress being made too. Kevin, you have all the best ideas. We need to we need to just get you in a room and then just build all the stuff that you come up with. <laughs> I'm down, man. You get you get me started, and I I love making stuff and figuring out possibilities. Like that's the part of of coding that gets me excited. I am not a polish every piece and get everything down. I'm a prototype, and what are the possibilities we can open up with this? So if y'all want to hack with me and and help me make that happen faster, the problem is I never have time, right? Like clients will pay a little bit for that and they'll mostly pay for it. You got to actually finish this application. (laughs) (laughs) All the actual hard work of polishing it and and shipping it. Yeah, I'm I'm like that too, but I just say I, I, I just never finish anything. So it's just, all, oh, I have this great idea. I'm going to hack up a prototype. Oh, wait, this was way too ambitious. <laughs> I think I'll think of something else and, and move on to that. I'm such a pessimist that I actually shoot down my own ideas before I start coding. So in that, in that sense, I'll save myself the time of building the prototype. Of course, that's also the joyful part, isn't it? That's actually a great skill that I wish I had, was, was the able, was to be, is to be uh, able to shoot down my own ideas a little more quickly. I've found that for me, it's two different mental modes, right? Like, and I actually, I, you'd be surprised, but the one I had to learn was the, uh, the opening and the imagining one. I started out being exactly like Jared, where I would just shoot everything down. Oh, that can't work because of this. Like that can't work because of that. Uh, which, you know, when I was, I co-founded a startup and my co-founder was a big idea person and she would always have these ideas and she got so frustrated with me for shooting him down. Uh, and what I learned is really that was counterproductive shooting it down that early because we as humans have different modes of our minds. And when you're in exploratory idea generation, 
yes, the first idea is not going to be feasible. And the second idea probably isn't either. And if you shoot it down there, you never get to the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, which is where magic happens and where you start to see, oh, wow, there's actually something real and cool and, and possible there. And so you kind of have to to shift your mental state into, I am not in judging mode. I am in creating and imagining mode and then just go. So I find that judging mode actually helps creativity mode. So maybe you have one person operating in one sense and one in the other in terms of of actually saying, okay, this won't work because of reasons X, Y, and Z. And so that, that forces creativity mode to say, okay, let me adjust this factor. So it's not like a wholesale, throw it out. It's more like, this is why there's holes in this. And then that refines. So I could definitely see so, where. So long as you're able to, to give the, the, the way you do, okay, but we could do it this way or, and we could do it this way. Cause the concern is if you shut people down, they don't want to keep creating. So, yeah, I, I agree. Constraints are awesome, but it needs to be directing towards a positive energy. And most of the time I'm just talking about how I talk to myself. So it's like I'm shutting myself down or I'm, you know, I'm refining my own thoughts as opposed to like a creative, you know, four people in a room type situation. But yeah, I'm definitely on, on the same page with you there. We should train a model with uh, successful <laughs> and failed projects. <laughs> and then you can type your ideas into it and it'll tell you whether or not you're, 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 uh, <laughs> oh, it's like hot or not, head. but for, for, for yeah. ideas, you know, is this idea hot or is it not? I love how every, everything that we say ends with, we should train a model. And I'm over here. I've never trained a model in my entire life. And I'm over here like, let's just train a model. I wonder if you could, though, feed every single startup, like, you know, their name and, <laughs> and, and what, what, what went wrong. And then just you could feed that reasoning. Like, the yeah. problem is, though, what went wrong part is very difficult to put your finger on lots of times because there's so many things. Well, and it's an interesting problem because... It's going to be tricky to identify the relevant features that you've got to put into that, right? Like this is essentially what VCs are trying to do. They pattern match. They look at successful and they look at failed and they try to pattern match to, to new ones. And there's an increasing amount of discussion around the fact that it is uh, extremely flawed because at least we as humans will fixate on a lot of features that don't happen to matter that much. Like the the famous one is people fixating on young white men who went to a Stanford or a Harvard or one of these places, but uh, <laughs> which turns out to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you give them all the money, you're going to get all the successes out of them. Uh, and they start with a lot of money usually. So that's, uh, you know, self-fulfilling and not actually a valid feature. Uh, so when we're thinking about how do we train our ML models here, one, you're going to have problems where you perpetuate existing bias, uh, oh, we gave all the money to, you know, the young white men out of Stanford. And so those are all our success cases. So now our model says that's who we should give money to. And we perpetuate that existing bias, which is entirely, you know, based on bad history rather than uh, actual value creation. Uh, but then the other piece is when we're feeding this data in, like what data do we even choose to put in there about these exactly. startups? Right? Maybe that you know, those failures were due to, you know, co-founder issues, which is an extremely common source of failure where you have folks who used to get along and suddenly don't, and it rips the company apart. Uh, maybe that one was caused by, um, somebody got hurt. Like, how do we know to put in all this seemingly extraneous data? And how do you factor in the, the, the macroeconomics of the industry in which they were operating in during the exact time that they were operating in. But this new situation is now completely different, right? It gets, it gets hairy. It's interesting thinking about the bias thing because definitely a problem, right? Like, um, machine learning, as we said, is like, you're giving them examples, right? So basically a, a model, a machine learning model is effectively a bag of bias, right? It's a model it of bias because what you're, yeah. you, you I mean, it's based on the people that put the data in, right? And so how do we fight against, like like you said, Kevin, that problem of selecting based on history or based on our own conscious or subconscious biases in order to have high quality answers and not just the answers that we fed it? Yeah, this was discussed in in a lot of the talks at ML for All this week, which made me so, so happy. And I know that Paige Bailey has actually put together this guide it's on her github account um she is dynamic web page but spelled p-a-i-g-e which is amazing but um she, <laughs> yes, she put together yes so good she put together a resource 
which has a bunch of questions that you should ask yourself before you even start going down this track. You know, is my data going to be biased? How can I tell if it is? And where is my data coming from? Do I have the permission to use it? What are the possible um, negative outcomes that can come out of this? Like, what is even our goal in the first place? And I think that that was so cool to see that somebody is not just starting to ask these questions, but they're putting a framework together because one, um, one saying, and I'm trying to remember who actually said it was that some people say that machine learning, uh, you know, training data can be a mirror of the existing world that's out there. Um, but some people go as far as to say it's an amplification because if you're concentrating that data into something that can make such big decisions for you, that's amplification rather than just mirroring. That's true. Well, and a lot of folks give it additional weight. They say, oh, this is impartial because a machine did it, right? How could it be biased? It's a computer. It's not a person. Uh, there's a relatively famous example of that where folks started trying to use ML to guide sentencing outcomes. And they found you know, they trained it on historic outcomes and they found shockingly that people of color were assigned larger sentences than everyone else. Because historically we've had that bias in our justice system, but now suddenly it had the veneer of impartiality because it was coming from a machine. Well, maybe ML is, is like, like violence. If it doesn't work, you just add more data. <laughs> You said it's an it's it's an amp, uh, amplification of 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 what you choose to put in, and so the the more you put in, you know, the less <laughs> the less it beca- like the less amplified it becomes. That's going to depend on whether or not of what you're adding ends up just more and more of the same bias. I guess I think that there's certain there's certain collections of data in the world that are just not appropriate for us to use, given that even when they're cleaned up and everything, they're just really perpetuating the same things that we're trying to use machine learning to avoid. A lot of people want to use machine learning because they see a machine as unbiased. Um, But if we are directly influencing it with with our our own sort of results of that, especially like very long ranged historical data, that's that's when we've really got to think, think twice about whether or not that was actually a good idea. That might be a good place to end. Yes, it got really serious. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you all mind if I do a shameless a shameless plug? Not for myself, but for sort of for myself. So if you like this topic, especially around the ethics and these implications in the future of AI, we have a brand new show in the works from Changelog called Practical AI. And it's with people who are deep in the space, um, very well knowledge, very well knowledge can speak much better than I can, Uh, well-versed in AI, and it's coming to you very, very soon. So head to changelog.com slash practical AI and subscribe. If you liked this conversation, you will love that show. I'm very excited. I'm going to be someone who will be very attentively tuning in. Thank you so much for letting us know about that. You bet. So I wanted to thank everyone for listening to the show, and we hope you enjoyed it. A special shout out to the people who listened to us on the live stream. This has been another episode of JS Party, and we will catch you next time. All right, thank you for tuning in to JS Party this week. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the shows. Head to changelaw.com slash community. And do us a favor, share this show with a friend, read us an Apple podcast, go into Overcast and favorite it. And thank you to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. And we move fast to fix things right here at Changelaw because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. We're hosted on Leno Cloud Servers. Head to Leno.com slash Changelog. Check them out and support this show. Our music is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at Changelog.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.